Hey everybody, this is my second video update for the day. And in this video, I want to talk about what uh, Henry Kissinger said at the uh, WEF, the World Economic Forum, where he gave a, a video link speech and he talked about the Ukraine crisis. And <laughs> oh boy, for such a small island, it's so noisy. But um, we have to talk about Kissinger and what he said. And uh, I also want to talk about uh, what Dmitry Medvedev said in a recent Telegram post in response to the Italian proposal that was submitted to the UN for uh, a ceasefire in Ukraine. And we'll wrap it up with uh, a brief discussion with regards to uh, some comments uh, Turkish President Erdogan said vis-a-vis -vis Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis. And uh, we'll do a clown world, why not? We'll wrap it up with a clown world, second clown world for the day. So let's begin with uh, Henry Kissinger and uh, I'm going to eventually need to find a place to sit because I'm just going to read you most of uh, the Telegram post from Medvedev. But uh, Kissinger, so he, uh, he spoke via video at the Klaus Schwab World Economic Forum and he pretty much said that uh, the conflict in Ukraine needs to, needs to wrap up. It needs a diplomatic solution, a ceasefire. Otherwise, the, the West will find themselves in a hot war with Russia. A memo for Kissinger, I think that the West is already in a proxy hot war with Russia. It's, it's, uh, I think it's past the point where it's Ukraine on its own fighting against Russia on its own. This is Russia against, uh, against NATO with the Ukraine uh, army being used as a proxy. But um, Kissinger said that uh, there is, he gives it two months. There are two months left to find a ceasefire and to come to a diplomatic solution before this conflict spirals out of control and it absorbs all of the collective West. And we end up with, uh, with a wider type of World War III scenario. So, I believe that uh, Kissinger was, was trotted out at the, uh, at the WEF convention because um, he's providing the Biden White House with another off-ramp. I really believe that uh, there are a lot of forces at work, some forces in the Pentagon, some in the media, even some uh, in the Democratic Party who are worried about uh, the midterms in November. I think they're trying to provide Biden with enough uh, encouragement and enough uh, support from the, uh, the media community, say international statesmen, if you can call Kissinger a statesman, but um, all of these different different players and actors and institutions are starting to sound off about how a ceasefire needs to be reached because this is getting out of control for, uh, of course they say it's getting out of control for Russia because they'll never admit that Russia's waiting, but for them it's about uh, this thing getting out of control for the collective West and causing a lot of damage for, uh, for the Biden White House, for the Democrats, and for uh, the European Union as well, and the collective West economies. And so they're trying to give Biden as many reasons to, uh, to get an off-ramp out of this conflict as they can. And I think that Kissinger, his speech at the WEF was another kind of uh, off-ramp to, to signal to Biden. It was a signal to Biden to say, look, get out of this, find a solution. You've got about another month or two, try to find a way out of this conflict and let's move on to, uh, to monkeypox or Taiwan or something. But um, this Ukraine thing is not working out. 
We're going to get slaughtered in November. The European uh, economies are getting are getting demolished. The U.S. economy is getting demolished. The U.K. economy is getting demolished. And uh, this just has not worked out well. And so they're trying to give Biden the, the reason to to exit this uh, this failed endeavor. So that's why I believe Kissinger came out and spoke at the WEF. But um, let me know what you guys think. Otherwise, there was no reason for Kissinger to, to deal with this. I believe that uh, his speech was, was set up for, for a reason. And that reason is to try and help the Biden White House out of this terrible mess that they've put themselves into. So let's switch gears now and talk about this Italian proposal that was uh, given to the United Nations and it calls for a ceasefire in Ukraine. And we don't know much as to the details of this, uh, of this proposal. I don't know, have, have they published the details? I was looking for them and I couldn't really see the details of this Italian proposal. But uh, Dmitry Medvedev has seen the Italian proposal. The Russians, by the way, said they've received everything and they're studying it, uh, Lavrov and the foreign ministry. But uh, Medvedev got his hands on it, and uh, boy, did he sound off on a Telegram post. Let me just read you what he said, because it's, it's incredible. Thank you to uh, the Locals community, because this was in Russian, translated over. It was posted on our Locals community, and uh, Medvedev, he's become a hawk, a big-time uh, Russian nationalist patriotic hawk. Here's what he said in a Telegram post. The West is itching to create a peace plan to resolve the crisis in Ukraine, and it would have been okay if it was about preparing options that somehow take into account the realities. But no, it's just a pure stream of consciousness from European technocrats. Italy has recently distinguished itself by passing on to the UN Secretary General Gutierrez a four-step plan for a peace settlement in Ukraine through its, European, through its foreign ministry. According to the Italian press, one has the feeling that it was prepared not by diplomats, but by local political analysts who have read too many provincial newspapers and use only Ukrainian fakes. Here are some of these ideas. Point number one, Ukraine's neutral status and unimpended accession to the European Union. Everything is correct about the neutral status, but about the membership in the EU, they know it's a lie. No matter how much Kiev may fantasize about immersing itself in a European uh, idol, it has no chance without NATO membership. No one is expecting Ukraine to join NATO now, and they clearly do not want to see it in the European Union as it is too costly and dangerous. That is why they offer surrogates. Enough of the refugees who have already been foolishly sheltered. Unless the crazy Polish rulers are ready to bargain on this topic in exchange for the western region of Ukraine and the insane Baltics are babbling about Ukraine's accession to the EU to increase their own political weight, weakened by chronic Russophobic diarrhea. What a statement. <laughs> the autonomy of Donbass while preserving it within Ukraine. Clear nonsense and cheap projectionism. The republics of Donbass have decided on their fate for good and will not go back. This is unacceptable to anyone who remembers the fate of the Minsk agreements and the killing of civilians in the LNR and DR. The full autonomy of Crimea within Ukraine. This is direct boorishness towards Russia, a threat to its territorial integrity and a pretext for starting a full-fledged war. There is not and never will be a political force in Russia that would agree to even discuss the fate of Crimea. That would simply be a national betrayal. There is no point in analyzing it further. All of this is just an attempt to help Kiev save some face. However, Ukraine itself does not want to negotiate at all. They chose to forget about the Russian draft peace treaty long ago. It is as if there was no such thing at all. They are counting only on the flow of weapons and money from Western countries. War until the victorious end in vain and uh he goes on a little bit more 
talks about the peace initiative and how it's failed. Uh, if peace proposals are created strictly in the interests of NATO and the Western world order, then such moves should simply be ignored. Simply put, send their authors in an unknown direction and work on the steady achievement of the goals of the special military operation. So I think this was, I'm not sure if this was a human translation or a machine translation. It sounds like a little bit of both, but great job on the translation. Maybe I butchered some of it, but um, I think everyone gets the, the main gist of what uh, Dmitry Medvedev was uh, saying. If true, the fact that the Italians actually put in there the return of Donbass to Ukraine in exchange for some autonomous status of, uh, of the region, and they put the uh, return of Crimea to Ukraine in exchange for some autonomous status. Well, I don't know what the, uh, <laughs> what the, the Italian, if this was written by Italian diplomats, I don't know what they were smoking, but boy, are they, uh, they are way, way, way off. <laughs> I mean, they're not even close to uh, putting a proposal together that would uh, achieve some sort of ceasefire. And Medvedev made it known. And he ended it by saying that the special military operation is going to go as planned. Nothing's going to stop them. Negotiations are done. He pretty much says it. He says the Russians tried. We put forth some... Uh, some points to the Ukrainians way back a month and a half, two months ago, the Ukrainians rejected it on the orders of uh, Boris Johnson, the UK and the US. They rejected any type of peace. And now it is uh, fate accompli, as they say. So that is what uh, Dmitry Medvedev said with regards to this Italian uh, ceasefire initiative that was uh, given to the UN Secretary, Secretary General Gutierrez. Now let's get to what President Erdogan said with regards to Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis. And uh, Erdogan did not pull any punches. Pretty much Erdogan said um, that the Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis is, uh, doesn't exist. As, as they said in The Godfather, which one was it? Godfather 2? As uh, Michael Corleone said to Fredo, you're dead to me, Fredo. That's pretty much what, uh, what Erdogan said to uh, Greek Prime Minister Mitsotakis. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has lashed out against the Greek Prime Minister saying, Kyriakos Mitsotakis no longer exists for me, that's a quote, as he prefers to deal with honorable politicians who keep their promises. There's no longer anyone called Mitsotakis in my book, Erdogan said in a televised address on Monday, as cited by the Associated Press. This year, we were supposed to have a strategic council meeting. I will never accept having such a meeting with him because we walk on the same path as politicians who keep their promises, who have character and who are honorable. Erdogan accused Mitsotakis of sabotaging efforts to resolve long running territorial disputes through bilateral talks and breaking a promise to not involve third countries. Erdogan said that the Greek prime minister essentially told the U.S. government, don't you dare give Turkey the F-16s when he lobbied against its regional rivals attempts to upgrade its air force to on a visit to Washington last week. So yeah, Erdogan is pretty pissed off at Mitsotakis because he's making the claim that uh, Mitsotakis told the Biden White House not to uh, to sell Turkey the F-16s, and he probably told them not to help Turkey out with regards to the uh, F-35s. Addressing U.S. lawmakers last Monday, Mitsotakis claimed that the last thing that NATO needs at a time when our focus is helping defeat Russian aggression is another source of instability on NATO's southeastern flank. So... <laughs> Nothing new to see the Greeks and Turks fighting. We're, uh, we've been going at it for many, many decades. But uh, Erdogan, he gotta, the guy's got, uh, guy's got balls, no doubt about it. But, you know, if I, have, if I had to be honest as a, as a Greek, as a Cypriot, kind of stepping back and looking at the situation and looking where Greece is under Mitsotakis and looking, where, and looking at where Erdogan is, looking at where Turkey is under Erdogan, I have to say that uh, 
if I had to choose a, a hand of which to, uh, to play off of, I would definitely take uh, the deck that Erdogan is, uh, is playing, the hand that Erdogan has at this moment. Because uh, Turkey and Erdogan, they have something that the Greeks don't have, options. They've played a very smart game and they've kept their options open. They've, uh, they've used diplomacy and they've used it very well. Yeah, they've pissed off various countries. Finland and Sweden are pissed off, but you know, what, is, what does Turkey care? At the end of the day, Turkey knows that they have Germany and they have the UK on side. They always have the UK and Germany on side, regardless of what Germany or the UK may say about Turkey in public. Erdogan knows that uh, the UK and Germany will always um, choose Turkey in any type of dispute, especially with, uh, with Greece. And uh, Erdogan also knows that no matter what the US says at this moment, and, and no matter how upset the US is with Turkey at this moment, that uh, Turkey can always win back the US's uh, is favor. Turkey can always get the U.S. on side as well. And uh, Erdogan understands that. He knows that. And Erdogan did not burn his bridges with Russia, with Eurasia, China. He didn't burn any of those bridges. Flights from uh, Russia are still taking place into, uh, into Turkey. Uh, they're going to get record tourism from the Russians. They're still doing business. Uh, Turkey even uh, negotiated one of the, one of the failed attempts for ceasefire with, uh, with Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine, that Medvedev was talking about. And uh, Turkey has kept all doors open, the, the important doors. It's kept the important doors open. That includes NATO. Turkey understands that NATO is not going to kick them out, no matter what threats Stoltenberg may say or any other rhetoric that's coming out of uh, Brussels or Ursula van der Crazy or whatever. Turkey understands that when it comes to NATO, they are the most important country in the alliance. Much more important than, uh, than France, than the UK, than any country. And Turkey knows this. They know that they are the important country in the NATO alliance, especially for the United States. Just look at their geography. That's all you need to look at and you understand how important Turkey is for, uh, for the United States and for NATO. So they've kept all their doors open. Um, yeah, they've pissed off some smaller countries. Yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, muddied the waters a little bit, Erdogan, but uh, good on him. He's going to get concessions for, uh, for his yes vote, if he gives his yes vote. It's still not a certainty, but if he's going to give his yes vote, he wants some stuff in return. And uh, he has asked for F-16s and he has asked for... Uh, for help for parts with the F-35s. And uh, he might get that. And he's gonna get to keep the S-400s that he purchased from Russia as well. Now, Greece, on the other hand, Greece has closed all of its doors, every single one of its diplomatic doors. The only door that it has kept open and the only door that, that is available to Greece is uh, the EU and the US. That's the only door that it has kept open. Every other door it has completely shut. I mean, it's really shut the door on Russia in a big, big way. And, uh, you know, as you shut the door on Russia, you kind of shut the door on China and Eurasia and, you know, a big portion of the, uh, of the rest of the world. So Greece is pretty much at the mercy of Europe and at, uh, at the mercy of the United States. Now, people will say, what other choice does Greece have? I mean, it's $350 billion in debt to... Uh, to Europe and to the, uh, to the EU oligarchs. But uh, still, the, uh, the Greek government, the Mitsotakis government, they really played a poor diplomatic hand with regards to this crisis. They had options. They could have uh, done some things to, uh, to, kept, to keep various doors open, especially with, uh, with Russia and the East. They didn't have to send Four, four to six airplanes full of uh, weapons to Ukraine. They could have said, uh, no, we're not going to send weapons to this conflict. We can't afford weapons. We have, uh, we have problems with Turkey, so we can't afford to give up our weapons. They could have said something like that. 
But nope, the Mitsotakis government gladly sent uh, a ton of weapons to, uh, to Ukraine. And uh, that was a bad move. Greece was one of the first countries to close its airspace and to, and to come out with really aggressive anti-Russian, Russophobic rhetoric. So, I mean, Greece really closed the door on, uh, on any type of, uh, of options that they had available to them outside of the EU and the US. And now I believe that the Biden White House and uh, the neocons in the State Department and uh, the EU technocrat technocrats and kleptocrats, they understand that they have uh, full control of Greece. Not only do they control their, uh, their finances and their debt, but uh, they control Greece on a geopolitical level. And so, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying to, to look at this from an objective standpoint. And I have to say that uh, Erdogan is playing, uh, he's playing quite a good game. And uh, yeah, sometimes he overextends himself. Sometimes he puts himself in, in a bit of hot water, but he always finds a way out. He's very cunning and very clever. And he always finds um, a way to extract himself from uh, his overextension at times. Greece, we better hope that the, that the EU and the, U and the US shows us mercy going forward because uh, we are completely in, uh, in their control, under their control. We are completely in their orbit. There is, uh, there is no other options, no other doors available to us. And uh, that was a terrible diplomatic mistake from Mitsotakis. I mean, Victoria Newland. She, uh, she was in Greece two months ago, and uh, she pretty much uh, told the Greeks, you're ours, we own you. That was pretty much her statement. She told the Greeks, she told the Cypriots, forget about uh, energy security, forget about the East Med pipeline. You're gonna buy LNG from us. You're gonna do as we say and as we dictate, and that's that. I mean, in a nutshell, that's what she told. Uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis and Dendias, the foreign minister, and that was that. <laughs> and so anyway, so I mean, you know, what more do you need? Victoria Newland laid down the law when she was in Greece and, and uh, the Greeks shouldn't, shouldn't expect anything uh, outside of what, uh, of what Newland and Pyatt and the neocons uh, told them to expect, which is, that uh, they're going to be calling the shots going forward. So with that said, three interesting stories. Let's do a quick clown world. It has to do with Fabergé eggs, the famous Fabergé eggs. Now, if anyone ever has a chance to visit uh, Russia and to visit St. Petersburg, they have a fantastic Fabergé uh, egg museum. And uh, there are some Fabergé eggs which are on loan to... Um, from last year, November 2021, which were on loan to uh, the, a museum in London. And let me find out which museum it was. The Fabergé eggs were on loan from uh, oligarch Victor uh, Vexelberg, Russian oligarch Vexelberg, who's sanctioned by the way. And they were on loan to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and they were part of uh, its Fabergé exhibition. And so that exhibition has wrapped up and now those eggs should return back to Russia, but well, they might not be able to return back to Russia because of sanctions. And the fact that uh, Vexelberg, this oligarch, is, uh, has been sanctioned by the collective West. And so we're kind of, uh, stuck in in a little bit of a pickle right now with regards to these Fabergé eggs. And we had a similar story that uh, I reported on a couple of months ago, and it had to do with art from the Hermitage and the uh, Tretakov Gallery. And this art, around 40 million worth of art, was passing, by, uh, passing through Finland, and it was on exhibition, on loan. And it passed through Finland, and Finland confiscated this art eventually. Finland uh, decided to give this art back to, to the Hermitage and uh, to the Tretakov Gallery. But, you know, it was uh, stuck in limbo for about uh, a week until the Finnish authorities finally said, you know what, we can't confiscate and seize this art. 
And so now we have a very similar situation with these Fabergé eggs. I mean, Fabergé eggs are uh, priceless. I mean, amazing uh, works of art. And uh, this specific egg was commissioned in 1885 by Tsar Alexander III for his wife. And uh, it was given on loan to the uh, museum in London. And uh, they, they put a lot of provisions when they give these things out on loan. They actually put provisions in the contracts which specifically state that if events like what we have going on uh, occur, then these assets cannot be seized. In other words, they make these assets sanction proof. But still, with all the hysteria that we've seen around these specific events, um, it's not a certainty. <laughs> that uh, that these Fabergé eggs will find their uh, their way back to to Russia. And I believe the the one egg, uh, Vexelberg's egg, is uh, is one of the eggs that's in the Saint Petersburg collection. So let's see what's going to happen there. Let's see if these eggs make their way back to Russia. Uh, I believe they will. I think that at the end of the day, the UK, this museum will. Uh, We'll give these eggs back. But then again, as a Greek and uh, thinking about the, uh, the Elgin marbles that should be in Greece in the Acropolis Museum and they're not, I think to myself, huh, maybe the, uh, the UK won't give these, uh, these eggs back. And I think it's like two or three eggs or maybe there's, I know the Vexelberg is one egg, but I think we're looking at, I think two or three. I may be wrong, but uh, this oligarch's egg, Vexelberg's egg, definitely is uh, is one of the Fabergé eggs that's in uh, in dispute. So that's the uh, that's the clown world for this uh, this second update. I will leave it there. The Duran.locals.com coming to you from a sunny Nicosia, Cyprus. Take care.